All right, in this video, I'm going to go into a really deep dive, like crash course on commercial real estate investing and how you can actually create $10,000 a month in profit so that you and your family can live off of that as a new investor. This is a full length, in-depth course, completely for free. So I believe real estate investing is one of the best places for people to get it started that don't have a good idea for another business. It's completely changed my life. It's a very simple business when it comes down to it. And it's allowed me to go from working as a wage slave as for, for 15 years as an engineer in the corporate America to now owning millions, several million dollars worth of real estate that creates enough cash flow in my life that comfortably covers my living expenses. So real estate investing has not just changed my life, but some several people that I've worked with as well, including Rachel and her family. She started when she was in her early 20s and she went from being in debt out of college, deep in credit card debt, to then becoming a multimillionaire in her early 30s. She owns hundreds of rental units, has a portfolio of storage facilities, has an empire of storage facilities, and runs a successful brokerage all in her early 30s. Uh, another example is Nate, who was an electrician by trade, and he was tired of trading his time for money and helping his boss build his dreams. And he was tired of seeing his boss make all the money. So he decided he was going to get into commercial real estate, and he bought a 322-unit apartment complex as his first deal, and that it was 40% vacant when he bought it. And he and his wife worked really hard. And in 18 months, they turned the place around and then sold that property for $3 million over what they bought it for. So $3 million of net profit, liquid cash went in their pockets 18 months later. And he's gone on to build a commercial real estate empire in his own right using the same methods that we're about to go through here and the same methods that we teach at Real Estate 101 because it's really the fundamentals. It's all basic stuff. And using those same principles, Erin bought three mobile home parks and she actually has a fourth one under contract that she secured while traveling with her family in her RV around the summertime, traveling with her family, was able to make phone calls from the road and got a fourth mobile home property under contract. That's some of the power that real estate investing in the modern world allows you. And it really can create what we call 3x freedom, which is financial freedom, time freedom, and location freedom. You can do this and run the business and do what you want, when you want, with whom you want to do it with. And so we've helped hundreds of investors over the years accomplish these same goals. It's completely changed their lives. And this information I'm about to share is free. And sometimes the risk is if it's free, it must not be valuable. We're, we're just opening up the floodgates, no gatekeeping. We're serious about dropping this information here. So buckle up, lock in and get ready to learn just a crash course in commercial real estate. And this is going to be the longest video to date. And I'm, I'm just brain dumping my, my knowledge here, my experience, my, my, uh, the things that we've helped our clients do things that I've done. And so this is a good place to take notes, get your full AI transcript summary, take notes from that and get rid of your distractions and go through this free course. Before I dive in, I will be giving away a massive gift at the end of my next free class. So I want you to go ahead and join our school community so you know about that, so you can get involved in the community. And this is where I go live once a week teaching this stuff in a little more detail per uh, discipline. We'll go through several modules today and I'll go through each one of those in more detail every week going live. And this is the information you're going to use to go and build your empire out there in the world, own lots of properties, get lots of income and free yourself and spend time with your family and do what matters most to you. So let's talk about first, why, why is commercial real estate investing the thing that we're suggesting is the thing to do? So we always want to start with the idea that anytime we spend our time and energy investing in something, we want to like have a, a reasonable expectation of what the outcome is going to be. And I have gone through the experience of 
buying single family as a way to create additional cash flow for my family and came to the conclusion and realization many, many years later that I was spinning my wheels. I was working really hard and it wasn't the most efficient way. My goal was to replace my income and build wealth. And if your goals are similar, then getting into commercial real estate is a kind of a leapfrog strategy that keeps you from buying just one property, waiting a year or two, buying another property, waiting a couple of years, and buying a third property perhaps. With commercial real estate, you can scale much faster. And you can just start with a four unit or, or a duplex if you, you want to size according to your experience level, but then you can build and kind of scale up much faster. I spent the first three and a half years and I bought 40 rental units. So I was averaging about one property a month. And when I looked back on that and realized how much time and effort I was spending running around all over town managing properties and looking for deals, I could have just bought one 40 unit apartment complex. And a 40 unit apartment complex is a little bit harder to buy than a single family house, but it is not 40 times harder. And so this is why I believe commercial real estate is this final frontier for the average person to make meaningful wealth and replace their income for the average person who doesn't have another really clever business idea. If you have a really clever business idea that you have a lot of potential to make a lot of um, value out of and you want to go launch that business, go do it. If you're looking for something that you don't, and you don't really know what the answer is yet, is yet and you're just kind of groping around for uh, some strategy, this is a tried and true strategy that's worked for, you know, as long as, as we've had buildings, right? I mean, it's, it's a fundamental need that we all have. We all need a place to live. And we, we, in the U.S., we keep making more people. So for as long as our population continues to grow and our building doesn't keep up with the number of people that we're adding, the demand is going to continue to grow. The supply is limited. So this is our, our thesis on why commercial real estate is the thing to get into. Now, the reasonable question is, which asset class? Because there are a variety of asset classes in commercial real estate. And so that's why we're talking about this right here. We've established why commercial real estate, but now, okay, you agree with that and that this makes sense, but now what kind of things should I buy? Storage or hospitality or industrial or apartments? We believe you should invest in the thing that you understand the most, whatever that is. If you have experience managing mobile home parks because that's the business you're in, like Aaron did, then it makes sense to go and buy mobile home parks. Short of having any kind of inside knowledge or access to some special specific knowledge, we suggest getting to something that's in the order of residential. So mobile home parks, apartments, or anything that's kind of in, this, in the realm of I'm providing a place for someone to live. And the reason we believe that is because we all understand it already. Fundamentally, like we've all lived in a house, a mobile home park, or, a, or, or an apartment. We all know what that is. We, we've lived in these places. We know what we want in a kitchen. We know what we like in a bathroom. We know what's comfortable. We know what's not comfortable. There's less to learn because you have a lot of knowledge about it. So that's why we suggest multifamily as the place to start if you don't already have other knowledge in another discipline. Uh, I gave you the example of Erin. She, she was working at, a, or still does, work at a mobile home park company. She is a mobile home park manager, an employee of a, mo of a mobile home park manager. So she knows the business already. So it's very natural for her to go and buy a mobile home park for herself because her day-to-day -day job is managing mobile home parks. It's a perfect segue. If you don't already have that knowledge or that kind of experience, then we suggest doing uh, fam doing multifamily. So, okay, let's talk about module number two. We've established the thesis of why commercial real estate, what you should get into. Second is finding the deal. Like fundamentally, how are you going to go around to look at a deal and figure out how to work on it? So let's talk about the types of deals. This is really important. So. There are two fundamental types of deals that are on the that are available. There are on market listed deals, and these are through brokers. Could be for sale by owner, I guess, through LoopNet or uh, CoStar or Crexie, but typically there's, there's a broker involved. Same as with a residential property, uh, single family. If it's on the MLS, if it's listed, there's a broker involved typically. Okay, so 
The other type of deal is off market. And this is where the property is not actively being listed for sale right now. And you would then market to and find the seller directly and then ask them if they're interested in selling the property. It's a little bit harder to find these deals, but there's more meat on the bone with those direct to seller deals. On market is super easy to get started in that you can find lots of deals to look at. It's harder to get a good deal because there's more competition. There's more people that know about it. There's more people contacting the, the, the listing agent or the seller and saying, I'm interested in making an offer on this property because they've openly established it. So it's a really important detail to understand. Uh, I mean, talk about this concept of being in a auction house. So if you were selling something, would you rather be in an auction house with a whole bunch of buyers or would you rather be in an auction house with just one buyer? Naturally, you'd want to be in an auction house with a whole bunch of buyers because you want as many people to bid on your property and bid the property. You know, there's competition. On the flip side, when you're the buyer, would you rather be in the auction house that has that you're the only buyer or the auction house that has a whole bunch of buyers you're competing with? Well, obviously, you'd rather be in, in the auction house where you were the only buyer. And there's, and there's lots of sellers to choose from and you're the buyer just get to choose well, that's what direct to seller does for you is that you have to go and find these people, the auction house, and you offer to buy the property or ask them, would you, would they be interested in entertaining an offer to sell the property? And you'll get a whole bunch of no's. Like, yeah, I can't overstate how many no's you're going to get. But when you do find a good deal, they tend, they have the likelihood of them being good and a really good deal is higher. So we understand that we're going to create a marketing strategy around whether or not you're going to focus on on market or off market. And you can do both at the same time. That's just something to think about. That's a good frame to be aware of as we go into the rest of this, because we'll be talking about on market versus off market the entire time. And this, uh, by the way, applies for any asset class in real estate. It doesn't matter. There's either on market or off market. Second is to select the market that you're going to get into. So we all know that with real estate, it's all about location. It's the one thing about real estate that you can't change. You can't pick up and move your property. So location, location, location. You can do a lot of things to improve your property otherwise, but you can't change what's around it and the, the geography of, of the place that you're buying a property. And that's what makes real estate interesting is that it's a fundamental asset type that is, is real raw land. And then we make improvements on it and use it. And that's what, and that's what real estate is considered kind of a, a separate business type than really the rest of business is because it has this fundamental land component to it. And, you know, the, the old stories, you know, they're, they're not making more of it. So that's why we like it. And the best time to buy real estate was 20 years ago. And then the, the next best time is today. So fundamentally, real estate is one of those asset classes that you buy and hold on to because it tends to keep up with inflation. Over time, it will appreciate along with the prevailing interest rates and prevailing value of the dollar or monetary unit of, of your jurisdiction. So it's very important when you select your market that you're buying a place where you're, you believe there will be appreciation in that market. You want to buy in, an, in, a, in a rising tide scenario. You don't want to buy into a sub-market that's population is declining. In fact, you want to look for going and finding properties where you can buy, where, are, where the market is growing. A good example of this is Dallas-Fort Worth, or really lots of places in Texas, but Dallas is a good example. One of the fastest growing sub-markets or markets, major markets in the U.S. right now, and has been for several years and is forecasted to be that way for many years to come. It's a great rising tide market. There's a, it's an economic boom going in there, lots of new jobs, lots of companies are relocating to Texas and Dallas-Fort Worth specifically, the, the finance sector or, uh, and tech sector is moving to Texas and it's a good place to invest. So with that being the case, the population is growing and without no more housing stock, there's more people than there are places to live. And so they're trying to build new places to make up for it, but they can't build fast enough. Uh, across the U.S., we're not building fast enough, but in high-growing areas, that's even more of a problem. So what that does is it's, it's lower supply, higher demand for the thing that you're offering. So that's the kind of rising tide environment that you want to be in. So you look at the demographics, and you look at the employment trend. Are there new jobs being created? 
is their net growth in the population. And when there's net growth in the population, lots of available jobs that have high incomes, your rent will be higher. And when your rent is higher, then you have more potential income. So this is the kind of environment we want to look for. We want to be very, very careful about going into small rural markets that are declining in value. There's less people living there every year. And so the, the, the need for your unit is becoming less valuable every year. So be very careful about going to that. Not to say you can't make money doing it. There's a lot of ways to make money, but like why make it hard for yourself if you don't have to? And then you also want to get a very specific set of criteria. It's like what is your yardstick to measure if a deal is a good deal or not? So what does a given property look like? So we like to think of in this terms of capitalization rate. You'll hear, hear people refer to that as, as a cap rate. If you buy a property all cash and you, what is your return on investment? ROI or all cash cap rate. So if I buy a property and I get a seven cap, that means I put a hundred or I put a million dollars and I get $70,000 back. So if I put in a hundred thousand dollars, I get $7,000 back. If I put in $2 million to buy a property all cash, I get $140,000 back per year. That's a, that's the cap rate. And that's how we compare different types of asset classes to each other. So Mobile home parks, for example, tend to trade at a higher cap rate. They get a higher return because the management of it tends to be a little bit higher. So people look for these higher cap rates and they'll shift asset classes to go to higher cap rates. And cap rates are what we use to compare the different things together. So it's really important to understand what a cap rate is. It's really just your return on investment in an all cash environment. So when I say all cash environment, if you were to buy it for all cash, that is what your cap rate would be. Okay, so now let's talk about what your return on investment is if you're borrowing money. So let's say you can qualify for a 75% loan to value loan, meaning a million dollar property, you can get 75% of that from the bank, for example. So it'd be a $750,000 loan. So you have to come up with a $250,000 down payment. Now you calculate what your net income is, revenue minus expenses, and you get your operating income. And that operating income, will, after you pay your debt, then you get your net net income, like your net profit. And then that's your cash on cash return. So you put in $250,000 down on a seven cap rate, you're probably getting something like 70 grand back. And if you're getting 70 grand back, then you can calculate what your return on investment is. And we're looking for something between 10 and 15%. So what, what, what happens is your leverage allows you to, because you're borrowing money at a lower interest rate, you want to leverage that and you get a higher return on the money that you do put in. And so that's why people, if they have $10 million, they don't go and buy a $10 million all cash property. They'll put, you know, $2 million down on three or four different properties because they're spreading out their down payments across multiple properties and they're able to control own more properties with less money because they're borrowing somebody else's money for, for the majority of the, of the payment. And this is what leverage is one of the advantage of real estate is it's naturally an easy thing to leverage. And the reason it banks are so willing to use real estate for leverage when they lend money is because you can't run away with it. Like it's not going anywhere. Like you can't, it's like a car, you, you could, you know, go across the border and try to escape with it. With real estate, you just can't, you can't run away. You can't hide. They can foreclose on the property and there it is. Like the, and there's just no way to get away from it. So it makes it a very natural thing to use as collateral in, in your loan because it's, it's a physical thing that can't walk away. It's a very important lesson to learn and understand why real estate is such a valuable asset class. And that's one of the reasons. Okay, so let's talk about running the numbers. So running the numbers is some people get a little bit confused about, and it really is a very simple calculation. So what we want is once we get down to it, once you get the data from a, a, a listing, for example, or from a seller, uh, you can run your numbers in five minutes or less. You can do a back the napkin, quick and dirty, and I'll show you how right now. So you take the revenue, from seller, like what they've done over the last year, you take that revenue and then you subtract out the expenses. And the number that comes as a result of that is revenue minus expenses 
equals your net operating income. And you can think of this as your net income because this is the, the income that if you buy it for all cash that would be created. And then whatever you purchased it for, you would then divide that into it and get the cap rate. So for example, real quick calculation, the way I do this is let's say that there's $500,000 of, of revenue minus $280,000, let's say, minus and minus, minus $280,000 equals $220,000 of net operating income. And so you divide that by something that you bought for say $10 million and you get a 22% cap rate. So it's a really good deal. <laughs> let's say you bought it for, uh, let's, let's do two million, uh, $20 million. You get 11 cap. $220,000 of n net operating income per year, revenue minus expenses, is, and then divide that into the purchase price. In this case, it's a $20 million deal. So let's say you bought that for a sales price of $20 million. Your cap rate is 11%. And, and that's just how easy it is. Revenue minus expenses equals your NOI. NOI divided by your purchase price is your cap rate. And that's how you run the, run the numbers every time. It really is that easy. So I'm gonna actually run through a real example so that this comes to kind of hit you a little better. So we like to use Crexy.com to go and find listings. And so I recently went to Crexy.com, which is you can get a free, uh, uh, account and I just did a search for apartments that are out there that were being offered for seller financing. And so I found an apartment in somewhere in Kansas, real listing of six hundred thousand dollars was this purchase was a, was the asking price. And it's a twelfth unit apartment complex and each apartment complex rents for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so they didn't have specific uh, expenses. So we can do some quick back of the napkin math and do and, and basically figure out what we believe the, the going expenses are for that property. So really easy. The way you do that is you take, you take your revenue and, and the way you get that is revenue equals units times rent times occupancy rate. I'll explain what that means in a minute. And then expenses are what they give you, or you can basically use the expense ratio. So sometimes we don't, we don't have that. Uh, we have to make an assumption. And so typically we find for apartments, with the exception of a few major cities, the expense ratio is somewhere between 42 and 48%. So we just use a common 45% expense ratio, meaning it costs 45% of collected rent in order to run the property, pay the taxes, pay the insurance, pay maintenance, etc. property managers. And that's just a nice, easy way to run your numbers real quickly. And so in this case, let's do it. So I'm going to do 12 units times, times 650, which is the, the rent per month times nine, five, which is one minus the vacancy rate because I want to use the occupancy rate. How much revenue are we coming in? And you'll get a number for that. So let's, let's do that. So 12 times 650 times 0.95 equals seven. And you also want to multiply it times 12. So it gives you an annual number. We'll take this um, 740 I got times 12. And now you have an annual number. So don't, don't forget your times 12, like I almost did. And then you get your annual number. So this is the amount of income this property realistically gets from its rents per year. So let's think about how much now this costs to run the property. So it's one minus the expense ratio. So it's 0.55 times 0.55. So the revenue that comes in every year times 0.55, which is one minus the expense ratio, gets you 88,920 times 0.55 equals just a little bit shy of $49,000. So 
So that is equal to the NOI. And, and that's really how quickly you can do it. Number of units times rent times 12 if you get your annual number and then times your, your occupancy rate, one minus your vacancy rate, and then that times your one minus expense ratio. There you have it. If you, all you need there is the amount of, of the amount of units and what they rent for, and you can determine your NOI with a degree of certainty. You know, this is a, a, a back the napkin math kind of calculation, but that's how you do it, and that's how we do it. Every time we see a new a new property, we run through those exact same calculations that quickly to say there. Let's figure out what the cap rate is, right? So now we know what the NOI is, and they want. Uh, so 48,000 divided by 1,000, remember this is the sales price. What's the, what's, what does that mean? So 48,906, yep, divided by 600,000. Like what's the cap rate? I get the numbers right, yeah, 600,000. The cap rate is, you can do times 100 to get an actual percentage, 8.15. So you have an 8.15 cap rate. Okay, just just you want to put it in the in the percentage format, so you would just do times 100, basic math stuff. But just make sure it's clear. And so that's how you do it every time. NOI divided by the purchase price times 100 to make it a percentage. And now we we figured out that the listing price for this property is an A cap, and, it, and that's over my 7% cap rate goal. So I want to reach out to this this seller and and, and the other broker and say, Let, tell me more. Let's see if there's anything, uh, that are any surprises. But this would at least have me talking to them versus if the cap rate came in at 3% and we're like, that's just stupid. There's just no way that that, that makes sense. I probably won't even bother with it because they're not they're not in the realm of possibility. But an A cap is. So this tells me that I would, I would wanna make a, a call. And that's how quickly, that's what I'm doing is I'm going through these listings and I'm saying, are, are they in the right ballpark? Are, are they, anywhere close to anything over a six or seven cap. And if they are, then let's talk to them. And you'll find if you go and do this work very many times that the right now, especially the, the 95% of listings are way off. They want way too much. Everybody's sitting around waiting for interest rates to come down. They're hoping that they can get, they can sell at a premium and people are borrowing at a higher, higher rates. It doesn't make sense. And so there's been less transaction value or, or less transactions happening in the marketplace because of this dynamic. Everybody's kind of waiting for there to be a, a interest rate reduction and not pay, you know, what, what has been historically high interest rates um, in the last few years. So what this means is be prepared for looking at a lot of different properties and, and listings and seeing that the cap rates don't match up with what I'm telling you is what they should be. This is normal. It's not to be not a surprise. It's not not a cause for alarm. It can be frustrating. Just I'll tell you straight up, it'll be very frustrating because these calculations, even though you can do them fast, you're still doing spend a little time looking at them, and they're all coming up as not a viable thing to, to invest in. So, um, what we do then is we call up and say, "Is the seller negotiable?" Like I'm running the numbers. I need a seven cap. And this, this property is listed at a five cap, let's say, is the seller negotiable? I, I can't make five, a five cap work. And if the seller or the broker says, no, we're not negotiable, we don't want our number, and, it, and they're just not really willing to even have a conversation, then you just go to the next, you go to the next listing. And so what you're doing is you're sorting through all these listings and sellers, and you're looking for somebody who's ready to do business, who's ready to be rational and realistic about the numbers. And full disclosure, most of them aren't. It's just even in the best of times, people want to buyers want to buy it at, at, at as low as possible, and sellers want to sell it as high as possible. And if the seller is sitting around waiting for the best offer possible, you're not the guy. Move on. Okay, so let's talk about actually making an offer and negotiating the offer. Okay, so we are fundamentally looking for three things. We are looking for a seller who is willing to take an all cash offer that's well below the market price, so that we can make money. Most of them aren't, but that's that's the, that, that, that's what we will look for first. Second, could we assume a loan that they have that is 
it has very favorable long-term interest, fixed rate interest that we can assume. When you assume, then you're probably going to have to qualify for the loan, meaning that you have to have good credit and you have to have some sort of net worth to back it up. But if you're in that situation, assumable loans can be incredible. If you can't find one or you're not in a situation where you would easily qualify for a loan like this, then the, the next thing we ask for is seller financing. And seller financing is still probably our absolute single favorite way to buy properties. Most people don't understand seller financing, and so I'll talk about it real quickly. Seller financing comes in a lot of names, but they all mean the same thing. Owner financing, seller financing, owner will carry, seller, seller carry back, land contracts. I mean, there's like grant for deed. There's probably 15 different variations of what this is called. All it means is the seller is going to take payments over time. So instead of paying them all cash, and say it's a million dollar listing, and you pay them a million dollars, and then that's no more payments are owed to them, and their transaction is done. What you could do is say, I'll pay you $200,000 now, and I'll pay you the remaining $800,000 in monthly payments over time. And and that is seller financing. And you, the, the, the paperwork that makes that possible is a promissory note and mortgage, which is the same thing that banks are doing. So a bank is getting a promissory note from you and a mortgage that says that you will, <coughs> um, basically, they have the right to take the property back over if you don't make payments. Same thing with a seller. A lawyer is setting up a promissory note and mortgage that says, I promise to pay you based on these terms. If I don't pay on these terms, here's your remedy. I can foreclose, get the property back or and back in my name. And this is something that's being done all over the country all the time. You're just not aware of it. And businesses can be purchased this way as well. So, I mean, real estate is just a, a specific type of business. And so what we're doing is we're going through and offering one or all three of these scenarios to everybody we talk to. And so the negotiating strategies here are basically you want to talk to a lot of people and whoever needs the deal to happen the most is going to be the one that's going to, is going to air quote lose the negotiation. So we want to make sure that we're setting up the scenario so that it's a win-win for both sides, but fundamentally you want to be able to say, I'm buying cash flow right now. You don't want to buy a property and then hope that you're going to make it turn around and make money in the future. Like you want to buy into cash flow right away. And if it doesn't, then you need to move on to something else. And when you find the right seller who is ready to sell and they're in a situation where they have property distress, personal distress, uh, some sort of financial distress, something's going on in their life where managing this property is not their priority anymore. They're ready, ready to sell and they're motivated. And when they're motivated, you have the best chance of getting a good deal. And so you want to be that buyer who you're the only buyer in the auction house and that, that, that seller desperately wants to sell. That's what you're trying to find all the time. And it's work to find that. It, I, a lot of people hand wave, like, you just find motivation, it's great. You got to work hard to find this. And so work hard to find it. All right, let's see. So when you're working with brokers, anytime you make an offer, especially seller financing or subject to the existing mortgage, or a loan assumption, you want to make sure and let them know that we understand that you're in the business to earn commissions and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure you get paid. And that usually helps calm down the seller and the broker who are, uh, are unnerved by your unusual offer. And we understand this is maybe not what you're looking for, but we'll make you payments over time. We'll make sure and get you, get you paid. Uh, Mr. Broker, Mr. Seller, here's how you'll get paid over time. And what you're looking for when you're calling somebody or contacting somebody is you want to fundamentally know four things. And anytime you're reaching out to somebody, you want to know these four things. You want to know the condition of the property. Oops. Uh, condition of the property. You want to know the timeline that they were willing to sell on. You want to know the price at, at which they're willing to sell or terms for seller financing. And then you want to know their motivation. And the problem is, is people don't just step out and say, hey, I'm super motivated, I'm, I'm ready to sell right now, and here's why. That's not what they do. You have to kind of glean it from them. You have to kind of ask uh, prudent questions to elicit this information from them. And so when you're calling somebody, especially direct to seller, you're talking to the decision maker, and you want to find out what's the condition of the property. If we were to be able to get the right price or terms for this deal, how quickly would you be willing to sell? What, what's your expected timeline on this? Are, are, are you looking to wait for two or three years or you want to get this done in the next two or three months? 
And if they say, oh, yeah, two, three years would be fine, well, then they're not motivated. They're not in a hurry. They don't need to sell, and they're your wrong people. You want somebody ready to do business now. Uh, regarding price, uh, you want to understand their price, and they're always going to say something higher than what you're willing to pay. That's just the way it works. Very rarely will, will they say a price, and you're having to pinch yourself that that's, that that's so low. Like That's not the way it works very often. When it does, it's great, but but that's not common. And so you're having to figure out their price, and then you're trying to back into the numbers, figure out what works for you, and then you're going to make an alternative offer based on the numbers that work for you. And then motivation, you're usually asking, you, you're asking, I'm so curious, why are they wanting to sell this property? They've had it for so long. What's what's up? And so what I'm looking for is, like, is there any kind of surprises I should be aware of? Is there anything that they know they don't want to let me let me know? Um, is there something going on with their, you know, financial situation or the property or do they have some sort of distress? And when I detect that they're in a hurry, I'm usually excited because that usually indicates that there's some reason that they want to hurry up and get it done. And so a really good example of this is a deal that I recently worked on that it was a 50-plus unit apartment complex, and the seller listed the property for $6.9 million. And I was able to get the seller to agree to sell the property to us for $5.6 million. And I, I basically detected from them that he was in a hurry, and I said, there's no way I can get... Um, anywhere near 6.9, like I'm in the fives and even, even not in the high fives. And they said, the broker basically said, well, anything in the low fives isn't going to work. What can you do? And I said, um, if you can make, um, 5.6 work, then we'll, we'll make it work. That, that's pressing my, my limits here, but that's a number I think it makes sense for both sides. And they took it. And I'm, kick, I'm still kicking myself, and I wish I had gone lower. <laughs> I wish I had said 5.4 or something, because they did not counter. Um, they, they accepted my 5.6 from the, from the jump. And I have since found out that the seller is motivated. He owns lots of properties, and he's getting out of the business, and he's just not interested anymore. And he's managing all themselves, and he's being, he's being worn out. I was like, man, I wish I had <laughs> gone, gone uh, harder with my first number. It's still a good deal at 5.6. So once you and the seller or the broker talk and you come to an agreement on what you're willing to buy the property for, then you're going to put it under contract. If it's a off-market deal, we have a contract that it will be in the resources here that you can use. We really prefer you to use our contract because we have a lot of stipulations in there that allow us to extend the due diligence time period. So it gives you more time to either do your due diligence, raise capital, and just look for reasons to uh, get a discount, basically. Uh, if for some reason you're working with a listed property or the scenario is that they just want to use the, the state contract or a contract that they're familiar with on their side, um, we will do that, but typically I'm using some sort of an attorney to review it to make sure there's not any surprises, and I use that as a negotiating tactic. It's like, oh, well, you know, I, I really like to use my paperwork, uh, but if we, if you insist on using your paperwork, it's just going to take a little longer and cost a little more uh, to have the attorney look at it. So um, if you're really wanting to make this happen, um, you know, so I use that as a way to kind of like give them an incentive to, to work, use my paperwork. But sometimes they just won't do it, and you just have to use their, their paperwork. And so, for example, on the 57-unit property, we're using their paperwork. But what I did is I included an addendum, and I said, I'll use your paperwork provided I can use my addendum, which allows me to extend due diligence if the seller does not provide documents in the timely fashion as as agreed and lo and behold they said they would have all the documents within five days it took them four weeks to get all the documents to me so when a property is under contract it's your job to go and do due diligence part of that is confirming all the things that they've said tax returns leases profit and loss statements there's always like uh, records that if they kept a, if they've been doing a good job keeping the records, you can confirm with their bank statements and whatnot. Nine times out of ten, especially for mom and pop type owners, they have terrible records and they don't have their ducks in a row. And when you when they say they're going to have it two in five days, they never do. And so my timeline doesn't start until they've done their homework and actually given me and delivered their homework and had had a chance for me to review it. And that clause, that addendum that I put into the contract basically stipulates my due diligence time as a buyer does not begin until I have ex received and accepted 
all these list of documents. So once you get the property under contract, you want to understand those kind of key elements of the purchase and sale agreement. It's worth sitting down and reading a purchase and sale agreement to understand why we're putting those, those, those clauses in there. And here's the most important lesson to learn about people who first get started in commercial real estate is this lesson. You can escape the purchase and sale agreement based on some clauses that we have in there in any standard contract typically allows the buyer to escape and cancel the contract if certain things aren't met. If the seller doesn't fully disclose and provide documentation or it's subject to appro financing approval or it's uh, the approval of the property inspection from the buyer. So when the buyer pays for the inspection and gets the inspection report back, if you get bad news, you can say, this news is so bad, I don't even want to buy this property, cancel the contract, I'm out. And you, you're out through your inspection fee, but that's better than buying a bad deal. And so you have escape clauses based on certain attributes of the property and the, the financing. And the due diligence, very, very important, doesn't begin until the seller provides all the paperwork. And so don't skimp here. Work with an attorney. I know people are reluctant to pay an attorney. Rel relatively high fees of several hundred dollars per hour. It's sometimes as high as $500 an hour. It's worth it. These are big transactions. You want a real estate attorney on your side, making sure that your documents are uh, compliant with the state uh, practices and the state uh, codes and case law. And you just have someone over your shoulder kind of double checking the mechanics of the deal. They're not going to review the deal for its merit financially. They're going to review it from the, from its legal merits. So remember that. So the, here's a list of the due diligence items that we have people do. So we have them provide the tax returns. We get a survey. Title insurance is normal. We have them provide leases. We have them provide financial reports, which includes the rent roll, the trailing 12, the actual rents and expenses of the last 12 months, and then a profit and loss for the last 12 months. That's minimum. Oftentimes we ask that this for the last two years because I want to see what's happening over the last two years and if there's been any ups and downs and what is my cash flow going to look like when I buy the property. Okay, next you want to do a physical inspection. and. This you're going to hire a professional uh, who who specializes in apartments or whatever uh, asset class you're dealing with. You want someone who knows the business, and they're looking for the physical condition of the property. They're not going to guarantee much, but they will at least say that things are, look to be in a, a working order or not. Uh, you always get a title search. This is just just kind of one on one stuff. Is that as soon as the property is put under contract, that purchase and sale agreement is sent to a closing attorney or a title company, uh, depending on what state you're in, and they will do a legal and compliance review to make sure that the, the seller has the right to transact and transfer title from them to you. And you're, you're going to be buying this in an LLC if you haven't set one up yet, a, a local real estate attorney or, or your, your attorney or whoever you work with can set one up in whatever state you're in very quickly. Don't feel like you have to set up this elaborate asset protection scheme when you have no assets. That's unnecessary. It's very expensive. Not, you have nothing to protect yet if you haven't bought a lot of property. So just get a simple LLC in the state that the property is in. When you put it under contract, can, it takes you no more than two weeks in every state that I've ever done it in. And many times even faster than that. And so you also want to get some sort of an environmental assessment um, that this is something you can get from a local uh, engineer. And then you also want to get a third party consultant who knows the area and they're going to do an analysis on the market. They're going to do a market study and the market study is going to confirm and deny the, what you believe the rents could be. You can also get this from a property manager instead of like a third party market uh, analysis or you know a consultant if you wish. Just know that the there's no binding rules from the a property manager's point of view. And you but regardless, you're gonna want a property manager to go look at the property anyway and get their opinion. Would they be willing to manage it? If a property manager is reluctant to manage a property, there's usually a reason and you should pay attention. So let's talk about a real life case study where we had some unexpected issues discovered and we use these unexpected issues as a way to negotiate. This same seller who bought or sold the 
57 unit apartment complex to me, they said, we'll do the 5.6, but we can't give you any concessions after that. Like that's the, our rock bottom uh, sales price. Uh, we, we can't do any repairs. Uh, if you find something that's a surprise, we can't fix it because we don't have any money and it's just not gonna work. Like 5.6 is the bottom dollar. So we get an inspection done and we find out that the some of the the metal stairs are rusting out and when the that report came back from the physical inspection the we showed it to the seller and the seller right away said yep i'll, I'll pay for the stairs I, I kind of already knew it was going on so not a surprise we'll take care of it uh and so basically, basically they're giving me a credit of like two hundred thousand dollars for some pretty major like iron work on these metal stairs that are rusted out. And this was from the same people who were so adamant that the 5.6 was the bottom dollar. So I effectively got my $5.4 million purchase price that I was hoping for because the inspector found a surprise that they're willing to cover. And I didn't really have, even have to negotiate that hard to get there. Um, so it was really surprising that, that they kind of gave in so easily on that. And this just kind of gives me another indication of how much they really want this done. So that's a good indication to me that they're, that they're ready to m make this transaction happen, which is good news for me. You use the physical inspection or the market study or the environmental assessment as data points that then is comes back to you and the seller and you share it with the seller and you say look at what was happened i'm with the bad guy they shared information they came back to me and what are we going to do about this so i, I like to not have an adversarial approach with the seller i like to get on the same side of the table and think look at what the market has told us this is what we can do to maybe remedy this I still want to do the deal, but let's. We, this is new information that I wasn't aware of. How can we make this work? And a lot of times they'll negotiate something better than what if you had just asked for it, because the, because they're they're embarrassed or motivated or surprised by the situation, and they might be willing to budge. Other times they might be pretty upset about it. You never know. But you're not the bad guy because you went and got somebody else to go do it. Okay. Now, the next step in the process is building your capital stack. And when I say the word capital stack, what I mean is most of the money that you're going to be buying a commercial real estate property with is not your money. You probably don't have a million dollars sitting in your back pocket. Few people do when they get started in commercial real estate. Or even if you're pretty well off and you're buying a, you know, I don't know, a $5 million apartment complex, uh, our $5.6 million apartment complex, you don't have $5.6 million of just liquidity just sitting around. One day you might buy an apartment. That's just not the way it works. So people know that you're going to be borrowing money. That's not a surprise. And so the first step is to get a lender. Either the seller is going to be acting as the lender uh, with their own seller financing deal, or you're going to go to some sort of bank and get a loan. So you can use seller financing. You can go to a local bank and get commercial. You can do like these of agency debt loans, which is what we're doing with the 57 unit apartment complex. And there's a whole host of options, bridge loans, mezzanine loans, hard money loans. And there's lots of different types of lenders that can kind of help you build your stack. And so you think of it as debt first, then some sort of like bridge or mezzanine debt, and then you bring in equity. So equity is like your cash from your personal funds or from your partner's funds. It could also be money from another property that you sold and you're doing a 1031 exchange, which allows you to transfer without paying taxes. Uh, you could bring in money from uh, private uh, individuals that are just kind of like passive, <coughs> excuse me, investors. And typically when you're doing that, you're hiring an attorney to do what they call a syndication. It's a little bit out, outside of the scope of what we're going to say here uh, because there's that, that, that's a long topic in its own right. But simply stated, a syndication is when you are pooling passive investors' money together to help buy the property. So let's talk about this $5.6 million that I have under contract. So that deal, we're going to get loan proceeds of about $4 million. And so we're going to need to raise you know, $1.6 to $1.8 million of equity for the property. So we'll bring in some cash. Let's say we'll bring in 500K. And so we need to, we need to raise, let's say $1.2 million of, of equity from other people. 
what we're going to do is we're going to do a syndication and we're going to hire an attorney that's going to put the paperwork together and then we're going to then go and find private parties that can put in a hundred grand, 50 grand, 500 grand, whatever makes sense for them, probably a minimum of a hundred grand or 50 grand. And they can be a private limited partner in the deal. So they have no involvement other than cash. They have no ownership stake. They have no ability to make decisions. They just put in cash in and they get a return back at the end. That's a, a passive limited partner in a typical syndication. Whereas us, the sponsor team, we're called the general partners and we're the ones that make all the decisions and we're the ones that manage the properties and we're the ones that cut, cut checks, uh, both to, we collect the checks from rents, we distribute you know, checks to, to, for expenses to contractors and whatnot, property managers, and then we also cut checks to the investors. And as general partners, we can cut checks to ourselves, but we're last in line because we've put together the whole deal, but we're the last ones that get paid. So typically the limited partners get paid first and then the general partners get paid from cash flows. And as a result, they tend to make the most money per unit of, of time and energy that they put in, but they're getting paid for the management, for finding the deal, negotiating the deal, managing the deal, putting it all together, etc. And they're getting paid on the back end typically. So the big money comes from the general, the general partner when they sell or refinance the property. So that's a quick and dirty uh, explanation of syndications. So when it comes to entity creation, I think I've mentioned this briefly already, but use an attorney. It's not that hard. Um, they're going to give you good advice. Uh, typically, I find this is not really that complicated anymore. It's commonplace now to set up an LLC super quickly in nearly every state. Don't overstress this. This is not something to not go and make offers on because you don't have an LLC yet. Okay, so renegotiation. So we've got the property under contract. We've got their paperwork. We've done our due diligence. We've got the, the information back. And now this is this, this chance to renegotiate. So you use the bad news, the potentially bad news from all the inspections to then go back to the seller and say, we just found that there's rust in, in the stairs. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And that's where you use the information as a way to renegotiate. It's often re referred to as retrading. And this is your chance to go back to the well and get a better deal for yourself. Sometimes this is where you back out of a deal. When you go back and try to renegotiate, there's, there's almost no harm in doing it because if they say no, they can't back out. Like the seller can't back out. You, you've already put the property in your contract. And what they're worried about is that you'll back out. And so now you have a chance to renegotiate, retrade the, the seller and see if you can get a better deal. And I like to use the results as a, almost like a bonding way. You reinforce the pain that they've experienced, the management headache that they're going through and the reason they want to sell is right. Knowing their motivation is so important. And you want to have like, I like to be able to talk to the seller via text or a phone call. I talk to them a lot. I think it's very important to, because you don't want them, them, you want them to start to like you and enjoy getting the call from you so that when they get a call several months into the process and you say, Hey, I just got the report back. I've got some surprising news here. You have a chance to talk. This might be a difficult conversation, but I'm sure we can work through it. That is the kind of conversation that you want to be preparing for by being such a nice guy along and be cooperative and easy to work with. And when they hear this, they're like, oh, man, I don't know. Like, There's rust? What? Well, how about this? I'll send you the report. You look at it. Let me know what you think. I'm prepared to make it work, but this is new information that I wasn't aware of. And I had no idea that the condition of the stairs was such bad shape or there wasn't so, or the compliant, there was some issue, there was some red flag that came up and like, let's figure out a way to make this work. And you're, you're cueing them that this is going to be like a, a, a different terms now, like the lower price, uh, repair credit, something. So you're doing a lot of things in parallel. You're doing due diligence, you're raising capital, you're setting up your entities. This is when you're getting busy in this business is when you have these property under contract. It's where all the, that's where all the, the, the structuring happens and you're doing a lot of things at once. You're finding your insurance. Like, I mean, there's a lot of things that you're taking care of. So when you're building your team, you want to find your property manager. You want to find a real estate attorney. Uh, if you don't already have an accountant and bookkeeper set up that you want to get that set up. 
pretty soon. You definitely want to have an insurance agent that you have kind of on speed dial. So you can say, Hey, I got a new property. Uh, give me a quote because I want to figure out, you know, what's the best, um, price for this. Um, obviously if you're going to be doing repairs, you're going to need some contractors. A lot of times the property managers have a really deep network of contractors you can work with, uh, either sometimes directly with the contractor as a referral or the property manager will actually manage them themselves. Uh, sometimes the broker who, who is selling the property has, has a, that their brokerage has services that, that do property management or, or maintenance requests. And sometimes they're very incentive incentivized to get the property taken care of because they want their commission. So sometimes they have resources that can help. And of course you want a lender, you're going to shop all kinds of lenders. You're going to spend a lot of time talking to bankers about their terms. So you want to build your team and this is the process. And this is why we say pick a market and hang out in the market for a while, because part of the hardest part of this business when you're first getting started is this part is building your team up and building your team up takes a lot of phone calls and they don't know who you are. And you're trying, you're, you're trying to get on a zoom call with them and you know, you're, you're trying to get to know each other. And once you've done this a couple times in the same market, then the next property is so much easier because you already have your property manager. You already have your people. You already have your systems in place. You already have your property manager. And we like to hang out in places and, and we'll look for deals in an area where the mark property manager is willing to manage. So we want to know what their management domain is. And we want to stay within that management domain because we don't want to go and recreate a new network until we've got this down solid. And so we recommend that same thing to you. So now that all these things have come together, you're going to close the deal. So you've raised your capital, you have your investors, you've done the negotiation, maybe you've got a little discount and you're going to the, the closing table with the attorney or the title company and the seller and the, and the broker. And the, usually the way this works is they send you a settlement statement and you review the settlement statement ahead of time. It's kind of a couple pages and it basically breaks down left and right side, the seller part and the, and the buyer part. And you're looking to see like how much money that you need to bring to the table and you know, make sure that you have that much money ready. And the seller is looking for how much money they're going to see in the bottom line. And sometimes when they see that, they're surprised because there might be some taxes they owe or whatever. And sometimes I've, I've had the seller get surprised by that. And they're like, and they're like, I thought I was going to get more, but then like the deal's the deal. Like this is what we were talking about. So there's some negotiation there potentially as well when, the kind of the last paperwork comes in, assuming it's all lines up, you agree to a closing time. And usually the buyer will go and, and bring their funds and close. And then same day, the next day, whatever the seller will go and sign. And then both parties have now signed the paperwork at, at a title company and funds will be dispersed within two or three day business days, typically. And the, the deal's the deal. Like you've, you've solved everything. And a lot of times, when this is an existing cash flowing property, you get that month's uh, rent right then. So when you close, you might start receiving money pretty quickly. And that's when you're legit. Like you own the property, you're a legitimate real estate investor, and now you want to go through your process of uh, managing the property setting up all your loan payments. You want to set up your insurance payments. You want to, you know, open up a bank account or start putting money in your bank account. And you want to start having weekly meetings with the property manager. If there's a lot of work to be done, if there's not a lot of work, it's just like a pretty standard deal. You might only do that every other week. And then once you get a cadence in place, you might well then switch to once a month when things are kind of stabilized. But for the first few months, I like to be very present with the property manager, make sure that they're not dropping the ball because it's time for them to start leasing properties and getting properties turned over. That's, that's the most frenetic time. You buy the first property, you have a new property manager, and you do not want to just hope and trust it's going to work out. You want to be, even if it's a long distance conversation uh, and you're doing it from a distance, you want to be very present as far as being on top of what's happening and being aware of like the project plan that's, that the milestones are being hit. And you want to track the performance and you want to see when rents are coming in. You want to see the money coming in your bank account. You want to see your expenses going out and you want to pay attention to that sort of things. And after you own the property for a while, it may be, I don't know, one year, three years, five years, you will then decide if you need to refinance and improve your financial situation 
or just sell the property and make some money like Nate did and make $3 million. And you're looking at the potential sales price of the property and thinking, at what point do I want to sell this? And it, you kind of define to yourself, like, what is your primary goal? If you just want to hold a property, have some cash flow, and just let it let it appreciate forever and just play that game, go for it. That's a, a buy and hold strategy. Uh, you could refinance in three to five years, kind of monitor what's happening in the marketplace, figure out how interest rates are, are moving. Sometimes they move in your favor, and you might be able to refinance and pay off your, any investors you might have and maybe pull your own cash back out and then have basically the property has gone from 5.4 to $7 million in value. You refinance for 5.6 and and now the whole thing is, is levered and you have a million dollars plus of equity in the property with just like phantom money and it's just equity that's sitting there and then you have it all, all your money and your investors are then cashed out and now I feel like you're playing with house money. So you want to make sure you still have cash flow, but that scenario is amazing because you have a little bit of cash flow and you have some equity in the property and you have no investors other than the bank to work with or the seller if you're doing seller financing. So that's a very viable strategy. Or you can just sell. You can, if, if you find a scenario where you just have a lot of equity and you want to tap into it and you don't want to like, like lever up too much, you can just sell it, pull in your a million plus dollars if you want to, and then you might be done. Some people just do one deal and like, we're done. It's time to retire. We're going to kick back and enjoy the, our golden years. And that's fine. Another option is to sell, but then 1031 exchange. And I'll do a whole thing on 1031 exchange because it's fairly involved. But basically it's a way of buying another property that's real estate and taking the equity from one property and moving it to another and not paying taxes on that. It's called a 1031 exchange. And so that's a high level kind of soup to nuts explanation of commercial real estate and some of the things you need to be thinking about. And you'll find I have additional kind of zoomed in modules on each one of these, um, on each one of these topics for you to dig in further. But this is a really good high level introduction to what well, I, I feel like it's a very deep dive introduction, but it's, you know, over an hour long here of how the business works. And so you can kind of get a picture of the business. And what I just described here is what we do all the time. We work with the clients to go through these processes, go through the checklists, review the deal, make sure the numbers make sense, uh, how to put together your, your raising capital package, how to do seller financing so you don't have to raise as much capital. And this is the power of commercial real estate. You really can just find one deal and change your life. And we find once you do that, you're hooked and you want to start building an empire like some of the other clients that you've heard about. I appreciate your attention on this. 